Joe Biden, president of the United States and professional malarkey hunter. There are lots of cool perks to being president, right? You get a, a giant house with a bowling alley and a personal chef. You get that free painting of yourself. And best of all, you get to travel the world for free. And right now, Joe Biden is on one of the biggest trips of his presidency so far. So let's find out how it's all going in another installment of Grandpa's Day Out. President Biden's first stop on his European tour was the Vatican City, the place TripAdvisor rated best city to feel guilty for masturbating in. And while Biden was there, he had a very special meeting with a fellow Catholic. For President Biden, a day of devotion and diplomacy. America's second ever Roman Catholic president having a private audience with Pope Francis, with whom he's built a personal bond, giving him a ceremonial commander coin and a compliment. You are the most significant warrior for peace I've ever met. And with your permission, I'd like to be able to give you a coin. Now the tradition is, and I'm only kidding about this, if next time I see you, you don't have it, you have to buy the drinks. Now, I'm, I'm the only Irishman you've ever met who's yeah. never had a drink. <laughs> I know that. So, obviously, a very personal moment with a lighthearted one, as is uh, typical with Joe Biden, who ended that meeting today by saying to the Pope, God love you. You know, you got to give it to Joe Biden because it took everything in his power as an old man to not make that coin appear behind the Pope's ear. <laughs> What's this, Popey? Ah, here's a coin, kid. I'll see you next time, yeah. Also, the fact that he said, God love you to the Pope, that is the most unnecessary God love you in history. You don't need to say, God love you to the Pope. He knows God loves him. He had dinner with him last night. But I do think that meeting was cool to see because it's, it's nice that even though these two men are some of the most powerful leaders in the world, when it comes down to it, they're just a couple of old guys hanging out showing off their coin collection, talking about alcohol, making inappropriate ethnic jokes. I mean, forget the Vatican. These two should have been meeting in a sauna, you know? And it's adorable how the Pope acts so happy to receive that coin. You see him, you know, I mean, his house is filled with Indiana Jones wish list. He doesn't need to be happy about a coin, you know? Oh, wow, a coin from the White House. I'll keep it right next to the actual Holy Grail. Uh, throw this shit out, Vincenzo. Uh, Stoccazzo not giving me the coin. Eh? Are you gonna give me a coin? I said, the Pope, or this is Stoccazzo, little bit White House. Uh, from well, you see, I'm, I, it seems like I speak bad Italian, but actually, the no. Pope is actually from Argentina. He speaks Spanish. So I'm actually doing a very good uh, Pope impression because okay. I'm saying his Italian is not great. That's, okay. that's what that is. I'm gonna be honest, Costa. I think this is a good look for Biden because, I mean, he's Catholic and the Pope likes him. This is a good thing, right? I think it's a bad thing. I think it's a bad sign if you're trying to negotiate an infrastructure bill in the United States and in the middle of negotiations, you gotta run and talk to the Pope. Hey, Pope, uh, confession, we're screwed. <laughs> Isn't it great that they just get called the Pope? That's your new name when you become the Pope, the Pope. His name is Francis. Everyone calls him the Pope. It's like when you work at Denny's, the very first day you show up and the only name tag they have is Josh. You're now Josh. I thought that guy was Josh. Yeah, exactly. Everyone thinks it's Josh. Also, you know there's another former Pope out there. Pope Benedict? He's just around. He's hanging. He's like the Jay Leno now <laughs> of Pope. He's just fixing <laughs> cars in Germany. He was, a, he, he was a Pope. And he's not a Pope? I'm just saying, no one ever talks about Benedict. Former, former Pope? Former Pope. Pope, 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 previous Pope? Previous Pope. <laughs> All right, now, after President Biden exchanged Irish jokes with the Pope, he caught an Uber to Rome for the G20 <laughs> summit, where he and other world leaders got down to business. And they got, they got some, th some things done. You know, like, um, they, they, they agreed to create a global minimum corporate tax rate of 15%, which is expected to raise hundreds of billions of dollars until the corporations find a different loophole about five minutes afterwards. But when it came to another priority for the G20, tackling climate change, things weren't as successful. Even the first major in-person meeting in two years couldn't bring world leaders closer together on the issue of climate change. In the final communique, G20 leaders agreed to softer language on reaching net zero emissions, setting a target of, quote, by or around mid-century. Canada's pledge is to be carbon neutral by 2050, and coal was also contentious. G20 leaders did agree to end public financing of coal-fired power generation abroad, 
but there are no targets to phase out coal domestically. Damn, G20, now that is a flex. Did you hear what they said there? Basically, these leaders were like, no more coal for anyone except us. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got to go home and give a Pfizer booster to my pets. I'm sorry, guys, but how is climate change the most pressing issue facing humanity, but then your plan is to do something about it by more or less 2050? Like, that's a pretty good sign that something isn't actually gonna get done. If somebody says to you, yeah, yeah, we should hang out sometime. What's your schedule looking like in 2050? You're never seeing that person again. I don't care if they're your dad, you're never seeing them. Not to mention, I'm looking at the people making this pledge. Half of them aren't even gonna be around in 2050. That's genius. When are we fixing this? Uh, How much time do I have left? Yeah, yeah, around then. I mean, the bigger problem is that these steps that the countries have announced that they're gonna take, they won't actually reduce carbon emissions enough to reach the goals. So basically what they've done is said, I wanna lose 100 pounds by the summer. So I'm gonna do five push-ups a day. And then, I don't know, maybe I'll get tapeworm. We'll, we'll see what happens, you know? It's frustrating, Costa. The thing, you can't say you want to do something about yeah. it and then be like, well, in 30 years, we'll do something in 30 years. I can solve climate change in 10 minutes. You ready? Okay. okay. Here's how, well, they could solve it in 10 minutes. Stop having the conference in a fancy room in Glasgow and put the G20 summit inside of a California wildfire, okay? They'll, they got t- two minutes. Let's wrap this thing up. Location. They don't feel the consequences when they're in an air-conditioned room in Glasgow. The co- st- I like this. Uh, it's location. Okay. location is everything. Location, location, location. Yes. I'm the first person to ever say that. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> Joe Biden wrapped up Grandpa's Day Out by attending the COP26 climate conference in Scotland, a.k.a. England's fancy church hat. And although COP26 sounds like a Bruce Willis movie that never actually got made, it's actually the most important annual climate change conference in the world. Although that doesn't mean that it's the most exciting conference in the world. I call on you to commit to concrete actions to stop the destruction of this magnificent planet. This conference is one of the most important meetings in history. You have the chance to make decisions and reach agreements which will affect the lives of generations to come. This is my message from Earth to COP. On behalf of We the 15, I ask you, please help us to guarantee a safer future for every life. Please welcome Prime Minister of Italy, Mario Draghi. I don't know what's worse. The fact that he clapped for a speech that he didn't hear, or the fact that he fell asleep when the guy was like, this is the most important thing (sighs) facing humanity (sighs) of all time. And, And look, look, look. I know that the haters are gonna say that Biden was falling asleep during the climate conference, but think about it. How are we gonna save the climate? Not using energy, that's how. What's the one time you're not using as much energy? When you're sleeping. So Joe Biden was just doing his part, yo. That's all he was doing. And by the way, I don't know exactly how the chain of command works, but when he dozed off for five seconds, I think technically that means Kamala Harris was president at that time, right? First woman president, America, you did it, baby! You did it! You see what I did there, Costa? It's a joke about Costa! Michael! Shoot them, Lindsey Graham, use the guns, use the guns! That's not what I was talking about. I know. This guy. You know, if you ask me, the real hero of this whole thing was the aide who came in and woke Biden up. Because that was, that was slick, man. That dude should get a coin. If it wasn't for him, Biden might still be sleeping there now. Yeah, he'll just wake up next week in the middle of like a furry convention. Uh, I I don't know if I could rub one out to a squirrel, but God love you guys. So kudos to that aide who woke Biden up. I mean, people, people may not actually know this, but he's actually part of a new branch of the federal government. And they're on the lookout for recruits. When the world's most powerful man needs a power nap at the worst possible time. And the line between consciousness and chaos is as thin as an eyelid. That's when we spring into action. The few, the swift, the United States Sleeper Service. Join our team and you'll learn how to take charge when the president takes a nap Eagle is dozing. Repeat, Eagle is dozing. We're entering rapid eye movement. God damn it, get those eyes open. He's about to snore. So if you're ready to throw yourself into the line of tired, 
Join the United States Sleeper Service. Suck it, Space Force. Abortion. Ah, a great topic for any first date. Last May, Texas tried to ban abortion in a new way. They didn't outlaw it, but they made it possible to sue anybody who gave or helped someone get an abortion, right? And then if you win, you would get at least $10,000. So for example, if I drove someone to an abortion clinic in Texas, anybody can sue me for $10,000. Anybody on earth. You, my seventh grade girlfriend, Brad Pitt, anybody. Snitches get riches. And the reason Texas structured the law this way is so that the Supreme Court couldn't overturn it. But yesterday, the Supreme Court looked at this case anyway and they didn't sound too happy with Texas getting cute like this. Today, as protesters rallied outside the Supreme Court, inside for the first time, a majority of justices signaled they are not comfortable with the new Texas law. Conservative justices Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett today questioned whether that loophole should be closed. Kavanaugh theorized that a left-leaning state could offer a $1 million bounty against those who saw an assault rifle like an AR-15, then claim it wasn't using state power because only private parties could bring the suits. Uh Uh-oh, looks like the conservative justices are gonna have to choose what they care more about, guns or fetuses. And this is tough. That is, unless, what if women gave birth to guns? That's it, we just make women give birth to guns, then everybody wins. I will say, this really shows you how bullshit this law is, right? because banning abortion has been the goal for conservatives for over, what, four decades now? But even they aren't willing to do it like this. Like, it would be like a lonely guy finally losing his virginity, but only because he fell into the gorilla pit at the zoo. It's not what he wanted. It's what he wanted, but not what he wanted. And the justices are right. This law could lead to a future where everyone is just suing each other all the time. And let's be honest, there are already too many lawsuits in America. I mean, America had to make Jerry Springer a judge. Yeah, Jerry Springer. He has a court show now. Yeah, they were like, who's that guy who used uh, to have conjoined twins slap each other on TV? Yeah, give him a robe. He's a judge now. We need more judges. We need more judges. All right, but let's move on to a story about cryptocurrency. You know, it's like if money got into vaping. Everyone has heard of Bitcoin, of course. But did you know that there are thousands of other digital coins out there? Why? Because anyone can make a cryptocurrency. You, my seventh grade girlfriend, Brad Pitt, anybody. All you need is a computer and the willingness to bore your friends to death at parties. Anyway, the other day, an exciting new cryptocurrency came out called Squid that that the creator said was inspired by Squid Game, which is another thing that people do. They give their money a name based on a TV show or a meme, and then people who like that thing buy the coin, which, let's be honest, is the stupidest way to invest in something. Because what if the thing that you're a fan of becomes unpopular? I mean, trust me, that's how I got stuck with $10,000 worth of Cuomo coin, and now I can't touch it. But so many people wanted squid coins that the price of each coin shot up to nearly $3,000, which is when all the people selling it took all that money and disappeared. That squid game cryptocurrency we've been talking about on the program looks like it was part of a scam. What happened is called a rug pull. The coin's creators, they just abandoned the project by exchanging the coin for cash. They walked away with $3.3 million, or every dollar ever invested in Squid Coin. They left 40,000 investors holding the bag after the crash. There's a scam. Case closed. Oh, man. I feel bad for these people. I mean, not not too bad, because did they not see the show? Were these people like, wow, these nice Squid Games people are offering me easy money. What could go wrong? I mean, this is one advantage that real money has over crypto money, because the government can't just cash out and leave. You know, you'll never see Biden hopping on Air Force One like, ha ha, I converted all the dollars to yen. Sign out, Jack. Come on, let's get out of here, man. I did a little malarkey. <laughs> if you want to invest your money smartly, let me give you some advice. What you need to do is go to a bar near Wall Street at around five o'clock, hide in the bathroom, and then you see what professional investors are saying. That's how I ended up investing in a little thing called cocaine. Made a lot of money doing that. All right, and finally, let's talk about space travel. One day it'll be as glamorous and romantic as it is in science fiction. We'll fly past stars and beautiful ships and fight with laser swords. 
and make out with our sisters. But we didn't know that she was our sister at the time, which makes it all right. But right now, that future is light years away. SpaceX is faced with another engineering problem, this time in the bathroom. A leaky toilet is the latest issue on board the SpaceX Dragon capsule, which means everyone on board won't have a toilet during their journey. The four astronauts will have to rely on backup undergarments. Mm. I think they mean diapers. Officials did not say how long the crew would be without an inoperable toilet. You know, it's pretty humbling that no matter what technological advances we come up with, we've still got to deal with our poop. Which, let's be honest, is going to be really embarrassing if we ever meet aliens. Greetings, Earthling. Would you like to know the mysteries of the un... I'm, I'm sorry, did, did you just defecate in your pants? Yeah, man, sorry about that, dude. It was a really long flight. And I'm wearing diapers, though, so it's cool. Tell me about those secrets. You know what? We just remembered we have a thing in another galaxy. See you around, maybe. Don't come back here. But, you know, when we think about it, what is so embarrassing about diapers, huh? I, like, I honestly think that diapers are underrated. Like, if diapers didn't already exist and someone introduced them now as a hot new technology in 2021, be honest, people would be excited about them. Guys, what if I told you you never had to worry about finding a bathroom ever again because you would always be carrying one with you, huh? You'd make a killing on Shark Tank. Barbara, I know you take dumps, so. Let's get into the Democrats' disastrous night in our new and maybe frequently recurring segment, The Red Wedding. Let's start in the city that shook up the world in 2020. Since the police killing of George Floyd, Minneapolis citizens have been debating whether they should make defund the police a reality in their city. So yesterday, they finally voted on a plan that would reorganize and rename the police department, give some of their functions to non-police, and make cops more accountable. And that ballot measure lost by 12 points, which, let me tell you now, in politics is not that close. It's not like losing a football game by 12. It's like losing a baseball game by 12. Yeah, that locker room is quiet. Now, one reason it lost was probably that the details of the plan were complicated and what some voters heard was just the phrase, abolish the police. Because not a lot of people have time in their life to read the text of legislation. And the people that like to spend their free time reading bills, well, they could explain it to their friends, but they don't have any. But other voters did understand the plan and they just didn't want it. The African-American community is in a quandary because historically and currently, we are abused by police disproportionately. And on the other hand, we also are abused and killed by our neighbors. And so it's a quandary we're in. And when you live here though, you realize that the, we can't sacrifice one to address the other. Yeah, I see where that man is coming from. Because even if black people don't love cops, the situation for them is more nuanced than you might think. I mean, even NWA, they didn't want to abolish the police. Yeah, f the police, but you still need to have them around to f And by the way, just, just as an aside, it must be so hard to be a black barber, right? Because like 90% of your shop is always just filled with reporters trying to interview black people. I'm sure black barbers are just like, yo, hey man, black people go to other places too. You guys ever heard of a grocery store? Shit, I'm trying to cut hair. But let me tell you my views on this issue as well. Now that you're here. But aside from the rejection of police reform in Minneapolis, there were setbacks for Democrats across the country last night. First of all, they barely, and I mean barely eked out a victory in the race for governor of New Jersey. And that state is more blue than an orgy of Smurfs. But the bigger loss was in Virginia or as it's known by its full name, East West Virginia. Because Virginia has been becoming more and more democratic for years now. They voted for the first black president and the first black faced governor. So everyone expected them to elect another democratic governor. But Virginia had other plans. Republicans reign. Glenn Youngkin, the projected winner in Virginia's high stakes battle for governor, a stunning reversal in a solidly democratic state. All righty, Virginia, we won this thing! 
narrowly defeating his Democratic opponent, former Governor Terry McAuliffe. In a state, President Biden won by 10 points just one year ago. That is why uh, there on the, in the Oval Office, there's a big red warning light uh, flashing right now after what happened in Virginia with the Republican winning. Could be a red flag for the upcoming midterms for Democrats. Oh, okay, okay. I know there were a lot of factors here, but, but whatever this was, this, that definitely didn't help. I mean, I guess you know what they say, dance like nobody's voting for you. And what's especially shocking about this result is that Joe Biden won Virginia by 10 points just a year ago. That is a huge swing, people. That's like a Kim Kardashian going from Kanye to Pete Davidson level swing. Now, on the one hand, this is just one race to lead one state, please don't get me wrong. But as you heard, it could also be a bellwether of the things to come in the midterms next year. You know, the same way your girlfriend's saying, that guy's cute is a bellwether that you're gonna be single soon. So why did Democrats do so badly in Virginia last night? Well, it depends on who you ask. This is a major defeat for the Democratic Party. Yes, it's a referendum on President Biden. The voters are, you know, disappointed in Biden, angry at Biden, distressed about what other things they see about inflation. The problem with, with Democrats is they made this about Trump, and Trump was not on the ballot. Youngkin cut into McAuliffe's margins in Democratic strongholds by focusing on education, including the controversial critical race theory. There's no doubt that critical race theory is a weapon that he uh, utilized to great effect. The messages tonight is, is that the liberal policies that are being pushed right now through Washington are not necessarily very successful. This is not a referendum on liberal versus progressive versus moderate in the Democratic Party. This is a referendum on the fact that they haven't gotten anything done. Oof. All right, it would be bad enough if Democrats had one reason they lost, but they have like 50. I mean, it's Biden's unpopularity. It's worries about the economy. It's the fact that the pandemic is still hanging around like the Tootsie Rolls three weeks after Halloween. And then there's strategy problems. I mean, Democrats kept trying to fire up their base by making this race about Donald Trump. But here's the thing, Trump wasn't running. Honestly, Democrats, you should enjoy this break from Trump while you can, because after he wins in 2024 and declares himself emperor, you'll be running against him forever. And on the Republican side, I mean, there's no denying that Glenn Youngkin's fear-mongering about critical race theory also played a role. And honestly, this, my friends, this is where Republicans really excel. I mean, they set the agenda. They know how to play the game. Because a year ago, if you asked anyone what critical race theory was, they'd be like, I have no idea what you're talking about. But if you ask them now, they'll be like, I still have no idea what you're talking about, but I'm terrified of it. And it's not just critical race theory. Republicans have been doing this for decades and they are great at it. Everything America fights about, they start it. All these culture wars. The trans people want to use your bathroom. The gays want to defile marriage. There's a war on Christmas. They're trying to kill Santa. Dead people and illegal immigrants are voting. It's all them, smarts. What you need to understand is, if they can set the agenda, then they can choose the fight. Like if I'm gonna fight Floyd Mayweather, I'm not gonna choose to fight him in the ring. I'm gonna choose to fight him in a spelling bee, yeah. Then we'll see who the greatest of all time is, champ. C-H-A-M-P, champ. I mean, for the most part, Democrats don't wanna engage in those culture wars because they think that they can win on policy alone. But where that plan falls apart is that they're not getting anything actually done. Because all their ideas are tied up in infighting and bickering. And that makes a difference makes a huge difference in messaging because when Republicans say, Democrats are teaching your kids that white people are all bad, what can Democrats say? No, we're not doing that. Okay, then what are you doing? Well, right now we're trying to get you six weeks of paid leave. Huh? What, no, zero weeks? Okay, no paid leave, but we are getting you free college. Huh, what's that? No, no, okay, no free college, but we are raising taxes on rich people. What's that? No? Oh, we're cutting the taxes on rich people. And that's the Democrat promise. She has a simple message to the Democrats. You can come with all the nice ideas in the world, but if you can't make the changes that you promised, then best believe voters are gonna make some changes 
of their own. If you can, please consider supporting When We All Vote. It's a national nonpartisan initiative to change the culture around voting and to increase participation in each and every election by helping to close the race and age voting gap. Now, if you want to support their work, then donate at the link below.